Okay, I think that's enough staring at a menu screen for the day. Hello? Is the sound even on? <laughs> I think it is. There we go. Okay, so let's get this started. Hello? Kind of new to th new to this whole thing. It's strange that I've done podcasts, but I haven't really gotten used to live streaming. New experience all around. Thank you so much, Okaneko. Hopefully that means translates to the stream staying consistent. Alright, let's get th through this. Oh, no, it's not working. There we go. Uh, I think that looks good, yes. We're going to be doing the English version of this because it's easier for me to highlight different Yes, things. indeed. It is called Lothric. Hopefully where the transitory lands of the Lords of Cinder converge. In venturing north, the pilgrims discover the truth of the old words. The fire fades, and the lords go without thrones. Nothing like trying to balance my audio over epic choir music. Yom the giant. <laughs> Thanks. Feedback is wonderful. What were you doing again? Oh right, Dark Souls 3. That's happening. I want to thank you guys for coming in and helping me go through with this. I did not want to do another playthrough this year, or at least I wasn't expecting to. So, getting to work my way back up so we can get some proper screenshots for the website is wonderfully appreciated. <laughs> oh, we got a Yorm stand in here. Nameless. <laughs> Cursed and dead, unfit even to be cinder. And so it is that ash seeketh embers. And there's a premise. Well, it is Dark Souls, so hopefully. You would hope that it would be dark stuff, but you never know. Okay, let's see. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so name. Uh, I actually don't know what to put for this one. Let's, uh, let's go with something simple. Uh, Loki. Why not? Uh, class. Actually, you know, I always start with Pyromancer, so might as well. 
Why change things up now? Uh, burial gift. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll raise it a little bit more. There we go. Just a little bit higher. Just warn me, guys, if it ever peaks or anything. We'll, we'll, we'll figure this out eventually. Okay, so let me get back in here. Barrel gift. Let's see. Uh, why not black fire bombs? I think those are the ones I'll get the most use out of. Uh, Aerithelion. Gosh, that's pale. Yes, you're very slim. Make our character look more of a skeleton than Wolnir. <laughs> go for go for the the hard commit. Okay, sure. Let's go for the hard commit. For oh gosh, that is certainly ugly. Uh, make him a little bit more pale, like your Thalian. Yeah, that should be good. Yeah, we're we're going with this. This is some, uh, this is something, all right. Yeah, this is lore accurate, all right. I can see why I ended up in the Great Swamp. Okay. Let's change the hair, too. Uh... Skin color, no. Face detail. This isn't... I Maybe it's physique? No. No, it's definitely appearance, so. Face detail. There we go. I am blind as a bayet. <laughs> Hero of the people. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. You guys are too much. Uh, well, yeah, let's go with that, I guess. Actually. Gosh, I hate them all. <laughs> Can't we have Elden Ring hair options like ported back into here? <laughs> oh, it's so much better. Oh god, this is painful. The best part is I'm probably going to change this with Rosaria later on anyway. Sure. Sure. We'll, we'll go with this. Decide to make him red, red-haired, because the only thing worse than a Great Swamp Denizen is a Ginger Great Swamp Denizen. All right, finalizing creation. Let's just get this started. Let's... So we start out in the Cemetery of Ash. Lovely place. Perfect for a long nap, apparently. So we've been checking for my audio. Is the game audio good? Because I put it a little bit low to try to make sure I was audible. Should actually be looking at the screen when I'm running. There we go. It's a little bit deserted corpse. So right off the bat, we're getting surprisingly decent lore value out of this. Because the idea with what we'll see a lot consistently throughout is that these are supposed to be um, deserted corpses, but we don't get a lot of these souls in this version of the area. It's actually in Untended Graves. This becomes especially relevant because what we do get here is a lot of fading souls. And fading souls, obviously, tense the name. The idea is that they are like a flame, sort of like dying out. And 
we get all these corpses which are sort of left they're not gathering souls obviously they're dead and the point being is that eventually slowly over time at some point they will become fading souls and then eventually fizzle out into almost nothing if not nothing uh, another interesting detail to note here is of course the location we can see the exit where we used to get into intended graves from this area nice little confirmation that's always there now we'll move on <laughs> without the soul oh sneed you're in here <laughs> oh boy i promise you it was completely unintentional there we go we get our wonderful starting enemies now compared to say the asylum oh hey doggo you done napping yeah good on you boy anyway on our starting enemy, we decide we get a sort of gravekeeper. This gravekeeper is dressed in robes and stuff. It seems to be like it's a reskinned, uh, what do they call them? The Lothric priests. We know that obviously they're undead. We can get some chimes from this one. And it seems to be the idea that priests who turn undead in Lothric, they end up getting sort of tasked as becoming the gravekeepers because it's the holy orders that they can be trusted with. If, if something happens to them, no one cares, they're already undead. <laughs> nothing is unintentional Dia. exactly exactly clearly nothing is unintentional Miyazaki clearly is just uh 4d chessing us all the time hey Oscar uh one thing of course notable here is of course yes this is reusing Oscar's model but it's indication that there are in fact Astora knights still in the world even if Astora has been well gone kaput we also, of course, get an Ashen Estus Flask, which tells us that this one was probably uh, unkindled as well. Or at the very least, his uh, his flask has long gone cold. Either way, interesting. Of course, he's leaning against a replica of a Lord Vessel. Now, this faux Lord Vessel is incredibly notable in this specific area because there is so much architecture here that you can tell there was once a larger building at some point. Um, you can even see a little uh, smaller bell here. It's kind of like the bell tower that we heard earlier. Taking this all together, we're already being introduced to this idea that this graveyard wasn't always a graveyard. It was originally used as some other kind of facility, and that gets clarified as we press onward. Moving to this point. Oh, whatever. Just die. I don't even remember what this the the tutorials were for, and I am too lazy to check the messages. Oh, hey, thanks. Uh, so right off the bat here, we're getting um, fire arrows, and I think this is used pretty consistently, or fire bolts, whatever you want to call them. I'm pretty sure these are used fairly consistently throughout the game. Um, the significance, of course, also being shown to us later on, but it gives the idea that they are chiefly concerned with enemies that would be weak to fire in this area. Oh. Give me my Elden Ring quality of life features! Re! Can't even jump. There we go. Pathetic. Miyazaki, why you spoil us so? Uh, I do... Wait. Okay, there we go. It's on my other hand, that's why. So, Crystal Lizard. Uh, so, interesting, of course, with the introduction of these giant Crystal Lizards, as we learn later on, these are the products of, basically, you take one, uh, take one tiny Crystal Lizard, give him a soul, oh god, I'm dead. Yeah, add a soul that he accidentally eats up instead of some Titanite, and he turns into this. Now, this is obviously not too crazy of an idea. We've seen what the power of disparity can do in past games. What makes this one especially notable, to me at least, is that uh, because it's happening with a crystal lizard, it gives us confirmation of their process when they're trying to turn Titanite into the various other kinds we see, whether it be the Twinkling Titanite Knight or in what we see in this game is lots of gems. Oh. Oh, well, that killed me. First death. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
I'm just gonna blame that on looking at chat. I believe in. <laughs> you should not believe in me. <laughs> Believing in me is the last thing you should do. Clearly, I'm here for lore, not gameplay. <laughs> There's some fading souls. Gonna chop you down like the trees of the Great Swamp. Now, if I recall exactly, this alcove is a little ways near the uh, tower where we actually do find uh, Prince Lothric eventually and what we see in the cinematic. So that's interesting. Actually, do I need to kill you right now, buddy? You're technically optional. Eh, I'm here. Ooh. There we go. Actually, I should probably... Yeah, there we go. No, no, I deserve that death. That was greed. Men are weaker pyromancers. <laughs> uh, possibly. The thing with, with magic is that unlike, say, demon souls, it's not exactly clear the direct delineation between you being able to use magic versus... Um, you being able to sort of draw on magic because obviously in, in Demon Souls, magic revolves around the soul and there's a huge delineation on the potential, at least, of power with the souls between men and women. Women seem to be more in touch with the, with the soul on a more intrinsic, um, I guess the word would be intuitive nature. And then this can lead to obviously what we see with the witch Yuria compared to Freck, which he bemoans. In uh, Dark Souls, we don't really quite see that exactly. What we see with Souls is that magic sort of gets drawn on from various sources, not just the soul, and then the individual people who are drawing on that power tend to, I guess the word would be, try to uh, manipulate it sort of the same way that you might manipulate a law of nature. So sort of like when you create like a, a fan turbine or a something versus say when you like turning yourself to burp or something like that. It's something where it's much more external versus internal. Now, we can rely on the internal with the soul, because the soul obviously is also magic power, but it's not necessarily strictly a you have to do it this way. Um, so it's interesting to kind of think about how pyromancers get determined. Instead, what we see is that a pyromancer, say, like Cornix, can't necessarily learn the same way uh, that a female pyromancer like Quelana can. So... For example, uh, when we give the pyromancy tome to... Oh, that killed me too. Okay, you know what? I think I'm going to just leave you alone, buddy. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not getting anywhere here. So what we see with uh, Quailana is more of an example of she knows how to teach this pyromancy and she's able to put in a book, but she can't. you apparently can't do that with a man. And it's interesting to kind of uh, speculate what exactly the differences are with the women. Is it something to do with their souls and their potential? Because clearly you could be a woman pyromancer or a man pyromancer and learn these spells. But, or is it something that, it's something that only a woman could possibly understand on how they approach pyromancy. And that's an interesting uh, idea, concept to think about. So that was an extremely long, oh, long answer. Hopefully that was a satisfactory commentary. Ooh. Don't want to fall there. Uh, yeah, there's a bonfire. Okay, give me that thing. Now, of course, we see Firelink Shrine over there, though technically we don't know that yet. Uh, interesting, of course, always to point out, the way they do this, they just take the, the Lothric model and have it floating on top of this giant mountainous uh, terrain background. But it is interesting to worth noting that there is so many mountains on the backside of Lothric and that the way that they've designed the map, Illusory Wall highlights this actually in a very excellent fashion, that the, the Lothric architecture has been extended in a way to help hide what should be the various areas we'll see later on in the game. So, sort of trying to make sure that they try to keep all the essential bits hidden. So the idea, as we can see in maps and stuff released uh, 
in separate like accessory items and things is that the firelink shrine is located more or less beside uh Lo the Lothric, and we can see Prince Lothric's tower right over there. Hello, Mr. Gravekeeper. Oh, no. I can't uh, guard counter like an Elden Ring. I feel so spoiled. <laughs> Legit question for people who, who do play Elden Ring. Uh, how good is guard countering outside of um, PvE? I assume in PvP it's not as viable. Sorry, I'm gonna need those. Don't need you. Well, actually, no, we might need you later. Depends on how many fireballs I need to throw. I don't think I'm gonna have to worry, though. <laughs> well, that's one answer. Yeah, I figured as much. It seemed like one of the, it seemed like kind of gimmicky. I like it for like the some of the slower enemies, but it just seems like you need to do so much to make it work. Oh, so guys here. Thank you, buddy. Appreciated. Listen, mate, I'm just doing my job. Okay. So. Now, as we see more of this architecture, continuing on. Some reused Faron assets, because why not? More of these nice little gravestones written into the walls. More gravestones here. And we, we can kind of see how this was used to be sort of the big front chamber to this architecture and now it's basically been overtaken by the graveyard and the wildlife and all that one interesting detail about this of course not only besides the fact that half of it's apparently collapsed into the ether is the the big coffin here now we actually know from if you look closely at the cinematic you'll recognize this is actually the same coffin that yorm comes out of in the opening and we actually do have concept art and some cut content that indicates as much uh, for earlier versions of the game when Yorm was essentially the tutorial boss instead of Gunder. Now, Gunder himself, obviously, plus a man, kind of just flowing out of there around the chest area. And, of course, we got the, the sword. Now, Gunder used to be moved to... Um, uh, consume King's Garden for good reasons, but they make him still work here generally as the the what actually is it pronounced Eudex or Iodex? I actually don't know. I I I clearly never took Latin. Oh well. There's some nice pussy blood. Oh. Oh my gosh. I forgot how slow Gundir can be. Holy hell. Okay. Yeah, that's about what I was expecting. Oh. Well. I went a little too hard on those firebombs. Lost to first boss. Ree! Yeah, the, the interesting thing about the swords being stuck in the ground for Bundir, uh, Gundir's boss arena is that it sort of gives the same effect as, say, um, fighting Sif in Artorius' grave, where you get essentially this enemy, uh, that well, this boss, who has gone against many foes before, and they've sort of been laid to rest. Now, we don't know exactly why they're spectral, um, 
what exactly the concept that they were going with there. But it seems to be the idea is that, of course, Gundir is obviously a challenge that many have taken before and failed. Um, whether that's for the same reasons is a little different, because in he obviously doesn't have the... Actually, I don't think, if I recall correctly from the promotional images, we don't see him have the same... Uh, what's it called? The same... Uh, spiral sword stuck into his uh, body. Instead, he just has a bunch of different swords that you have to kind of take out. So there's this idea that it seems to be he was more of a generic guardian type. Oh. Also worth noting here that I've already taken out the spiral sword, but I have not. Uh, I don't acquire it as an item until I defeat Gunder. Uh, just interesting little deviation between gameplay and lore, where they have to kind of give you a boss reward, even though the game sort of tries to treat this as one continuous fight. I guess that tells you how bad I am that I can't win this first try. That was honestly kind of risky. I should have got dodged the other way. About what I expected. I don't think I can throw that far, so. But yeah, let's wait. Oh, I can definitely, though. Oh, that was close. Okay, so if I keep it around here, I'm good. Yay, beat the first boss. Uh, Gunder's title in the original Japanese is basically the same. It's supposed to be um, a judge, but they changed it in the localization to Latin. Now, it's not just judge, it's judge of ash. So the general idea would be, okay, you are um, you are going against um, Gun Gunder or G Gunda, the, the judge of ash. Now, because Gundir is a reference to Gundahar from, um, I think it's, uh, is it Germanic lore or Celtic? I think it's Germanic. All right, so we got the spiral sword. We move forward. Thanks, Rando Joe. I couldn't have done it without you. Oh, boy. Uh, broken straight sword. This is a common weapon we see these enemies use. And the idea with the Gravekeepers seems to be that they are using their swords, their fire bolts, their, I don't need fire bombs, uh, pretty much anything they can to deal with the pus like we see with Gunder. And unfortunately for, uh, for them, this system basically has Gunder basically just develop the pus naturally, so. Which sucks, I wanted his boss soul. Why you gotta do that to me, pus? A pyro throw! <laughs> Listen. We learned from Engi that it's okay to be a heretic of the Great Swamp, okay? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, we got a guy here, but let's level up first. Actually, you know what? First, let's go get myself killed by a dog. Where are you, little fucker? Ah, there you are. Oh, you almost killed yourself for me. Oh, no, I can't guard counter. Elden Ring, no! <laughs> uh, Alright, so, another good thing to point out is that Hawkwood has already placed a sword for the... Uh, the Abyss Watchers here. Now, if I recall correctly, he uses a different weapon. Was Is it like a generic Claymore or something when, he, when you first meet him here? So I think this is supposed to be his sword that he sort of kind of like puts down and leaves as like the memorial. 
tree skip. No, 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 we're not doing any skips. I might cheese some bosses, but we're not skipping. <laughs> Alright, first entered. Firelink Shrine! Yo. Is it strange that you have the least characterization of all the souls maidens and I somehow like you best still? No, just me? Okay. Ooh. Now, if you're actually listening closely, we actually are lucky enough to have the Japanese script for um, her little spiel here in the game file. So, it's actually a <laughs> it's actually a very great um, uh, little detail that we're able to get. So, for example, we're able to it's implied in Dark Souls One, but it's never stated outright. But we can confirm in Dark Souls Three that souls are in fact the power of disparity itself. So, it's nice getting these little kind of details that Dark Souls Three sprinkles in, even in the most minuscule of places. All right, let's see. I am... Uh, we're going to get Vort next, right? We're going to need some vigor then. I do not trust myself to survive. And then... Yeah, sword. We'll do, work, worry about you later. <laughs> Base take on Firekeeper, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I am not listening to you. I'm going to be having to hear you so much. Uh, anything I want from you? Uh, no, I think we should be good. I guess I could get more firebombs, but no. And then, everyone's favorite fan service. What's good about Andre here is that he basically doesn't... He sort of gives us also uh, uh, an idea of not only that obviously we're returning to Dark Souls 1 areas, but we're also being able to... Well, I guess like proximity-wise, but we're also getting to learn that one, he doesn't introduce himself as from Astora because Astora is already gone. We also get this idea, of course, that he now has learned quite a few things that he didn't learn in the original game, such as how to deal with Estus Flasks and stuff like that. So, interesting little... Uh, uh, hints being sprinkled that'll be foreshadowed later when we get to places like Irithyll, so. It, it, it's nice that when, even though obviously he's been added for fan service, that FromSoft actually did kind of put, some, well, Mizaki at least put some thought into sort of justifying why Andre ends up working here in Lothric. I don't think we have anything that I want to upgrade. Or that I can upgrade, even. And then, hello, Crestfallen Warrior. Now, obviously, we're not just normal undead. We're now called Unkindled Ash. Uh, y yes, Andre is undead. Um, though, obviously, in the case of Firelink Shrine, being undead is a, uh, uh, requires a little asterisk, depending on if you work there or not. Th thank you. Uh, we see here with um, Hawkwood, of course, that he in sort of introduces the concept of unkindled because we're no longer just undead, we're now unkindled ash, which, as he clarifies, we're basically no good. And the opening sort of, again, sort of kind of like briskly defines this as well as that, okay, so you tried blinking the fire, and one way or another, you ended up failing. And as a result, you got burned, and the burning basically reduced you to ash. But because you're undead, either beforehand or upon this uh, point, you are now basically coming, your, your body gets reconstituted as though, um, though sort of permanently changed into ash. Uh, yes, Andre was already, uh, undead in Dark Souls 1. Pretty much everyone you meet in Dark Souls 1 is undead, at least that are the human characters, barring, um, Sigland. Yeah, pr yeah, pretty much every human you meet is undead. 
Um, it's not until Dark Souls 3 that we really start expanding into the idea that people aren't just, um, that you can meet not just undead people, but just, um, normal, everyday, ordinary, uh, folk. Or at least those people were alive up until shortly before you, <laughs> uh, sort of up until shortly before we kind of, like, come onto the scene. Because in Dark Souls, and, well, any Miyazaki game, everyone has to die, like, literally, like, five minutes before you get there. It's like, you walk in, you just find a bunch of people standing over corpses. It's like, ah, oh, darn it, if only I, you know, sp sped run, like, a little faster. <laughs> Can't work that way. But, uh, we have our wonderful little advice boy here. I, I will also say that he's definitely my favorite of all the games. I just, I, I do like the fact that they do give him character. Hey, man, I don't make the rules. Well, maybe if you just invest in charisma. Okay, yeah, we're not getting anything out of him. Uh... See you later. No, Leonard. Yeah, Andre definitely did probably live longer than some of the gods at this point. <laughs> uh, we can't reach here until we get more souls, so we're good. I think that covers everything we need to worry about here. Uh, I can still level up a little bit, though, so... Okay. Let's get this over with. And then we can get to the game proper. Yeah, let's just put it all into Vigor for now. And then we'll put it some into Strength. Or actually, we're going against uh, Vort, so maybe Intelligence or Faith would be better. Now, as we see here, we still got a little bit of uh, another Lord Vessel here, so it gives us the idea that the ruins that we passed through earlier with their own little faux Lord Vessel were... An original Firelink Shrine like this, and now it's all reduced to ruins, and this Firelink Shrine is become the newest one. Now, it seems like it's actually older than its role as the Firelink Shrine. We can obviously see that there's lots of uh, little graves and things being done here. Uh, our little resident grave robber here seems to have broken up of the walls, dug through some skulls and bodies, and done, uh, done a little work there. But well, we can see that it looks like uh, the graves are being made here for the cemetery. So this is basically a, uh, a mortuary uh, building. And then it was basically like, well, <laughs> we used up all the other space, so we got to put this somewhere. So they decided, okay, this is going to be the new Firelink. Because as we can see, there are lots and lots of lords and ashen ones that have been buried in this place. Lots and lots. You know, it would probably help if they, like, invested in some, like, infrastructure... Because, like, the fact that, like, all their their rocks keep on collapsing, clearly, they just weren't prepared for earthquakes. Where's all that Lothric tax money going? Hey, Teen Sith! <laughs> Welcome! Glad to have you here. Let's go to our first area. High Wall of Lothric. Now, this is... Kind of neat in that our first area we're war war uh, warping to proper is actually not to another bonfire. It's actually to this. Now this is this type of stuff has had a. Do we have a? We still don't have binoculars, so I can't give you a close look. But as you can see, there's this little shrine to a uh, to a bonfire, a firelink shrine. So it seems like this is our connection point that lets us be able to warp to this spot in particular because we've seen before the idea that if you create models on something, whether it's paintings or uh, statues or things of that nature, you can actually create a sort of quasi-connection to the real thing. So, for example, um, when you pray to a statue of the Forceborn, even if it's kind of broken, you can still interact and receive miracles and worship from the, the god. 
and we see this with, say, Statues of Elka, and we see it with, say, uh, the painting of Nishandra and Dark Souls 2. The same idea that uh, good, good quality artists are in demand in this world. Interesting little shrine we got here. We also see the uh, crest for Lothric army with the little shield. Now, what's interesting, of course, is besides the fact that it's laid on an altar surrounded by candles, is that on the sides of these areas, we see all these skulls and bones being used here. We also, of course, land immediately on this little grate, um, which we see in Elden Ring gets reused in sewers. So its purpose being used in order to like drain liquids and fluids is fairly self-evident. Um, so we have this idea of sort of ritual human sacrifice being performed here to the bonfire in mirroring how ashen ones, undead, etc., are sacrificed um, in the same manner in order to help support the first flame. So it's an interesting little establishment right off the bat of, okay, Lothric is this culture which is venerates the fire linking to the point that they are willing to kind of reenact it in these self sacrifice, uh, these human sacrificial rituals. And as to what humans they pick, we'll, 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 we'll get there. All right. So first thing we do is leave this tower. Beautiful. Again, I wish I had binoculars for this because it would be really great to kind of point out. We can already see Consume King's Tower over there. See the barracks that we'll eventually get to. Grand Archives. Uh, Dragon Barracks. Obviously Prince Lothric's little tower little the bridge a bunch of the areas over there a little easy teasing yeah. hey Anorlando we'll get to you later Now, the game's also been priming us for the idea of stagnation from the cinematic opening, but this is the first time we really get a good look at what stagnation entails as of Dark Souls 3, with these characters who look like they were human, but they've turned into trees. Fancy that. Honestly, one cool thing I would have liked to do is maybe do Assassin and try doing a, a quasi-stealth run in this, but we'll see. Maybe a new game plus. All right. Oh, boy, you're a tough doggo. All right, come on, teleport. Yeah, that's what I, that was what I was expecting. Well, FromSoft likes their dark fantasy. So human, a little human sacrifice is almost inevitable. No, let's... Yeah. Just block, bro. Do I want to deal with a pus of man? No. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Okay. First backstab. First fail. Dark Souls 3, everybody. Beware, big axe guy. Yes, I gotta beware. Where is he? Where is he? He's gotta be coming back. There he is. All right, let's actually do my class. I swear, if he jumped over that, I was going to be so pissed. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, sure. I'm not sure if this... Die. There's the cathedral. Yeah. So we're right above Vort's area where the gates are. They're praying to who? 
Oh, okay. So what we see with the with the various characters we see praying is that they've prayed to different things. Uh, most of them you'll see praying in direction of Prince Lothric's tower because he's the the last hope and all that. Um, others will be praying around the little tree statues here uh, because they're, as you can see, some of them are even facing each other, kind of like as if they're all like climbing, like expecting, hey, hey, dude, <laughs> send a little prayers, <laughs> send a little my prayers with yours. But the general idea seems to be that. Uh, everyone here, as you can see, are civilians from their clothing. And if they're soldiers, they're at least soldiers who are off-duty dressed as civilians. Though, honestly, I don't think there's a single soldier off-duty out here on the walls. Uh, and the idea is they're trying to, uh, they've all escaped up here for reasons that become obvious later on. And the purpose is, is that they're basically kind of praying, hey, save us from whatever's going wrong down there. And then we also have, of course, the statues of the high priestesses. This, sort, again, a little kind of shrine here. Sort of reinforces the idea that they are... Um, there's a religiosity among the soldiers who are stationed here. And that there's uh, quite a huge influence of this uh, robed and hooded character. Now, you'll see throughout the series that Miyazaki and company like to use uh, hooded women in robes to represent either usually a, a, a sorceress or a witch or to represent a uh, a holy woman or a saint and the idea is that these uh th these figures tend to um become incredibly important in the various cultures that we come across obviously elden ring we see this image used usually as sort of symbolic of ranala and the karian royal family and we see oh, there we go so another deserted corpse uh, obviously, we see Dark Souls 1 uses it a lot when trying to represent, say, Velka. Uh, Dark Souls 2, more Velka. <laughs> but th the same general idea. Does she use magic? Is she sacred? If yes to either, then you, you can deduce the identity. And this is something that is true for most Dark Souls effigies. Miyazaki likes using simple images with very um, obvious meanings that are common to most people. That lets it be... Um, evident when he's trying to convey more complex like story ideas especially when it's in conjunction with other um images in a very simple fashion oh god that lock on nearly killed me <laughs> maybe i should have been a priest oh right you exist no one coming up from behind okay thank you i needed that we also get to see an early look at statues. Again, another look at the stagnation. We're seeing a dragon turning to ash. Just a piece of it just flaking off. Now, it's also an interesting confirmation that we have wyverns here. Um, as we learn later that Lothric uses wyverns as their steeds. So to see the, all these wyverns sort of around here and uh, dead shows us that there's been conflict with the steeds with someone. And as we can see, it looks like these are kind of with the soldiers. Look, more guys praying. This one to the dragon. Hey, buddy. No. Ooh. Ooh, this is where the binoculars are, right? I think so. There we go. There we go. Ah, I feel whole. Uh. Actually, no, we don't even want this on my hotbar. Get this off, get this off. Why would we do that here, dumb? Uh, there we go. Can't enter that tower, unfortunately. All right, so we're moving right along. We see all these soldiers who look like they probably just took a lot of effort getting rid of this wyvern and are exhausted. Understandable. They were also kind enough to put up uh, nice some chairs for all the citizens, though they don't like to use them. Ungrateful little bastards. That's a big drop. Okay, got some gold pine resin, some early far on foreshadowing. 
Oh, well, I deserve that. I deserve that for just going Oonga Boonga with so low health. Well, this time, though, we can skip through a lot of this. Fire bombs. Lothric loves them some fire bombs. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're still alive. Locked gate. Hey, buddy. Oh, you've got to be kidding. A fine rada rada. Yes, though, if I recall correctly, Dark Souls 1's a little further down, right? Because you have to kind of get behind a locked door? Or am I thinking about a different area? There. Thanks. Soul of another deserted corpse. Uh, interesting thing, of course, here is that there is a cage here. Oopsie, sorry, Geralt and a, a table with a chair here. So it gives us the idea that this is supposed to be, or at least was at one point used as a uh, prison cell. Now, of course, it's got the ladder and the barrels and stuff inside and things like that. So it doesn't seem like it's been in use for a decent time. Yeah, yeah, the house before Taurus, yeah. That's where you would find the gold pine resin. And it's usually, of course, obviously early, uh, usually from a gameplay perspective to give you some early game uh, lightning damage, since it's usually for mid to late game stuff. Okay, when's Wyvern Boy showing up? Is he up here? He's up here, isn't he? Well, I'm dead. I don't know how I'm not dead, but okay, whatever. Yeah, sure, let's go with that. <laughs> I don't know how I did that, but whatever. <laughs> uh, let's open the gate here before we do that. There we go, shortcut unlocked. Oh, God. I don't know how I dodged that, but whatever. Actually, my skill would probably be faster for this, huh? Ah, oh, damn it, too low fast. That was tight. There we go. That was a few close calls. <laughs> luck is a human attribute. <laughs> Clearly, I've been investing in my luck stat in real life. There's our first instance of a Lothric Knight, right on cue. Oh. Oh, screw you. Screw you. Come on. Oh, fine. Listen, I'm not going there while this buddy, your buddy here is ready to spy me. Come on. Let's get rid of you. Oh, my. <laughs> I can't just mindlessly swing. Ree! People told me this game was easy. Alright, we're not going to worry about Night Boyo. 
Oh, he's gonna worry about us though. <laughs> well, that was another. Uh, that was another amazing hitbox. Well, oh, this is a. Uh, this is awkward. What? Oh. Okay. Thanks, bonfire. Not even lit. Oh, there we go. Oh, that was totally a backstab. Yeah, I was not gonna hit around there. I was hoping I could angle it. Oh my god, you're AI. Perfect. Hello? Hello? Oh, that's why. Only took two. I guess it's because it's an assassin type. Alrighty, so where are we position wise? Uh, there's our dragon friend. There's our other dragon friend. There's where we entered. All right, and then we're heading to the barracks. Oh. Don't have slumbering dragon crest ring. Ree! Oh, thanks, buddy. Oh my god. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Thanks, guys. You made this so much easier. We'll get items later. More prey into there? Oh, did not change that fast enough, okay. Wait, that, that that's a block? Okay. Okay. So many deserted corpses. It's almost like there's a battle ahead here at one point. Uh, interesting to note, of course, these little dark corruption splotches. We see them outside. We otherwise only find them in the cage with the dark race, so they seem to foreshadow um, the dark race appearance. Can't be looking away. They really hate the idea of you throwing a fireball. <laughs> you know, it's it's really awful. I mean, why why would you let the pyromancer cast pyromancy? It's only in the name, in English. Oh, he's way faster than me with that axe. Oh well, that co that covers it. Let's just avoid the knight this time, and we're good. More fire bombs for Fort. There we go. Don't have to worry about it. Actually, let's do a quick, because I don't think I have the key yet. So let's just laugh at Grey Rat. Oh god, you are so tanky. Yeah, I figured that would hit. <laughs> we'll get our Dark Wraith key later. Yeah, this is on PC. I am playing on the PC. Some throwing knives from assassins. Some storage for all the, all the, gunpowder that they kind of save for their fire bombs. Ow. There we go. 
Now, of course, again, another little gate thing to kind of indicate that we're heading into a prison area here. Um, we get some bookshops for um, bookshelves for some recreational reading. We got a little bit of pots and jugs and stuff, you know, just stuff to characterize the place, depending for the weapons and all that. A little eating area. And then you can see down here, when the boys are not hanging out, one of their buddies is, again, another little thing where there's a table and a chair. This table actually has stuff on it because it seems like it's been used, and obviously it's actually the guys actually keep and watch over the prisoners. Now, this seems to be the indication of what the human sacrifice is all going to. They, whatever, whoever they imprison and capture in the walls, kind of lock them up here, and then it's like, okay, well, what do we do with them? Well, if they're not going to become slaves and they're not going to become sacrifices for the fire linking, um, well, you know, we could just, you know, sacrifice them for our little fire linking recreation down the line. Keep the cells open to keep intruders, uh, intruder population low. <laughs> and we'll go back to here. If I remember, this connects into the barracks, so... Don't need to zoom in on my little wolf pelt here. Don't want to offend PETA. There we go. Oh. Hey, Wyvern. Oh, yeah, we're not we're not gonna be able to dodge this one, so. Oh. Thanks. There we go. Yes, burn. Burn. Get back here, you. I don't know if I actually need you. There we go. Raw gem, eh, maybe. So yeah, more of these. Some of them look in the Grand Archives. There we go. There's our big boy. So as we can see, lots of damage and stuff done that they've been repaired. This is standard fare in Dark Souls when there's lots of conflict. Things get broken, people try to quickly repair it so they're usable in the middle of the chaos. Eventually, though, everyone goes hollow. Let's get this quick. Damn it, that running really screwed me up. Fester on the draw, my buddy. And obviously, you have to add on top of the fact that there's all this destruction to the to the rock and all that that's causing things to just kind of collapse. Uh, do we actually? No, no, no. We we want to go the long way. <laughs> the cycle of light. Yeah, rolling through all the furniture, making it reset. Such is life. Hey, buddy. All oh, right, you exist. Tiny shard. Ball. <laughs> hey, we both whiffed on this one. I won't tell anyone if you won't. There we go. Well, this is. Now, we've entered the barracks formally, going through some storage, standard stuff like weapons, things like that nature. Oh, right, you exist. And it seems to be commanded by a Lothric Knight. Now, we've seen two Lothric Knights so far. One of them seems to be stationed on the walls, another seems stationed here. They seem to be so sparse at this point because they are basically commanders in the army, basically. Higher ranks being knights and all that. Um, so the standard infantry basically just follow whatever their captains order. 
Now this one is what has the guard blazoned with the uh, the shield blazoned with the the crest of the high priestess. So, or the high priestess's guard specifically. So the idea is that here we are dealing with. Here we are dealing with uh, a facility that is basically very closely aligned with the high priestesses that we saw statues of earlier. And again, kind of reinforce the idea of how much religiosity plays into the Lothric military. Yes, burn. Now this is a rest area that the knight was patrolling. So many deserted corpses. More recreational reading. Lothric pride. We also probably one of the better looks at the shields on the wall. Now, one of them is the uh, shield of the, we see again in association with the high priestess's guard and things like that. So again, strong connection. We also of course see a wooden shield. Now this is specifically the wooden shield used in Dark Souls 2 with the lion crest. Um, but we don't actually see this, at least it's not an acquirable item, in-game. So this is the only places where we can actually kind of find these. It's especially important because it tells us that Lothric associated themselves with lions originally, but when we see the wooden shield later, we'll see it use the Dark Souls 1 variant, which associates them with a white dragon. Go figure. Uh, here first. Oh. I gotta remember to two hand. I keep on mixing that up. Broadsword, no one cares. Uh, again, more general areas where recreation. Guys gotta hang during the apocalypse. Linked with Faram? Yes. Um, the lion isn't necessarily linked with Faram intrinsically, but yes, it is one of the symbols that we see associated with them. And in this case, we see. Um, not just with this shield, but other aspects which link to Faram and thereby the Firstborn, which of course becomes relevant for Lothric's history. Little, again, little teasing looking at the Consumed King's Garden. There's the entryway that we usually take down to the lift. You can also see the tower back there. They add this dumb wall thing there that's super low quality texture. It's like, oh boy. This is a 2 2016 game, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we can go one floor lower, so. Ooh, there we go. Those guys are done. Uh... This is not the Astora Sword, is it? No, it's the Silver Eagle Kite Shield. Yeah, sure, let's go with this. Kind of give us an idea of what the soldiers sort of are keeping in storage in this, again, a barracks, a military base, basically, um, that they keep in the city. So it's kind of serves almost like a police station. Um, obviously the knights and the soldiers have to, when they're not out warring, they've got to be keeping order at home. So this seems to be their relay point. How do we want to approach this? I think I should worry about the dogs first. It's always the dogs. Oh God, you're going to take forever to come around, aren't you? There we go. Yeah, that was going to hit. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, that can happen, but that requires aiming, and I do not trust my aim. <laughs> Yeah, they do, the, the Lothric would do a little bit more due diligence on where they're putting all these barrels full of gunpowder. Oh, wait, dang it, I'm out of, out of pyromancy? Ree! Well, this is actually a great segue. So, obviously the game no longer does limited number of spells 
uh, depending on stats and things like that, it's now completely revolves around the character's FP value. Now, FP, or focus points, is basically from Miyazaki's attempt to implement uh, willpower, the willpower stat from other RPGs, into this game. We hear uh, Andre clarify that Estus flasks um, are sort of ways to strengthen our life and will. So, life obviously referring to regular Estus, the heat of the bonfire is basically sort of in liquid form, allows us to get an, uh, restore our, our bodily damage and things of that nature. And then the Ashen Estus Flask, which has the, oh, whoopsie, has the perfect little form of a, of a blue bottle, which has sort of gone cold and it's crystallized and things of that nature. Uh, <laughs> lets you be able to get an idea of the, uh, the, the, the ability to sort of remain conscious as an entity. So, for example, um, when we see, say, stuff related to sleep, that's going to deal with focus because obviously your awareness, your consciousness is, is going to be affected if you're using quote-unquote sleep magic. Now, this has to be the Astora Sword, right? Astora Straight Sword. Now, I haven't covered Astora on my website post yet. There will probably be an analysis of Astora in one form or another um, forthcoming, hopefully before the end of the year. I would really love to cover On the Fate of Astora on here. But suffice to say, it's very clear now that we see an Astora knight who seems to have been well, among the unkindled. We have seen an Astora sword now from a chest here stored. It looks like we've had a lot of Astorans coming here, and not all of them are either staying alive or keeping their weapons. So, very interesting to consider why. Ooh. Are we safe? Now we've got to worry about that doggo. Gotcha, bitch. Sell key. We'll go for Grey Rat later. Extra shard. All right, I'm feeling pretty confident here. See, I would never know if it was busted there, Sneed. <laughs> I have never paid attention to that type of stuff. I know it with Elden Ring's new patch, like, tons of stuff got changed, but... I haven't seen even half of it, so as far as I'm concerned, it's going to be all, like, new new stuff to me. Uh, where's our buddy we... Oh, well. Well, I missed you. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I wanted to give you a quick death. Never even saw it coming. Uh, embers! Ooh, embers is a great thing. So, you'll notice there's lots of fire here. Now, embers obviously are humanity with a burned look to it. Looks like our buddy's going to stand there for a little while, so this gives me a... There we go. A little check. You can clearly see it's a humanity sprite, but the, the spirit has been basically kind of made charcoal, and it's still retaining some of that heat. The Japanese for ember literally means um, a left or a remaining fire, so the idea is that this is sort of the, the fire that's been left, uh, been left uh, behind when we are collecting it or from enemies and, and others. And the point being is that these embers are basically humanity with a little bit of heat. Because one problem with being ash is that ash is obviously post-flame. And what happens post-flame is that they go cold. So it's like, okay, we're very cold and we really want heat. We're attracted to it just by our, in our very nature. We want uh, to be warmed by flame. Um, kind of makes a bit of a masochist if you think about it. It's like we're burned by flame, but we kind of still want it to burn us more. Uh, I do not have any pyromancy for this, so... Our little executioner knight here, though, has apparently been doing his duty. Getting rid of all of these. Poor knights. Now, we're able to kind of just roll through these guys. They're not considered solid corpses. Um, part of this, I, I assume, is because they want to show off the physics engine for Dark Souls 3 in an early area that was in the network test. And part of this is, I'm assuming, that they were... Uh, trying to also give us some foreshadowing to the idea of enemies themselves just kind of like turning to ash after they die. 
which is Nito. That's it? I remember there being more. Oh boy, that's bait. I'm not I'm not going for that while you're staring at that, buddy. I know, bait when I see it. But say, you're gonna stick staying there? You know, we can do some more talking here. Oh, I see. It was blessed with magic damage originally, uh-huh. Yeah, that's true. One of the cool things we see here with the uh, barracks is that their entrance, which I don't think, yeah, we're not actually able to get to the entrance because I think we stay one level up. The game doesn't actually let us see this. But as we can see, the entrance has been all boarded up. They're basically trying to keep themselves inside and keep uh, Executioner Knight there out. And we can see how it's ornamented again with statues of the High Priestess, robed hooded woman. This specific statue will be used to represent the High Priestess in various areas. Well, I should say various areas, but various areas in Lothric. It's a very nice attention to detail. And of course, this square has um, a statue of Prince Lothric at the center. We do see statues of gargoyles. Now, for those who are unaware, these gargoyles used to be a Lothric enemy, first and foremost. They were later moved to the profane capital and obviously kept at the Grand Archives. The lore, though, shifted around. We can still justify their inclusion here in the same way that Lothric, we see, is using various... Um, various ornamentation used by Sullivan. You can see here on his, uh, he's also using the profane greatsword here. So in the same way that we see that Lothric is sort of adorned in a way to honor the pontiff, we can also imagine that these um, gargoyles are here because they found their way to Lothric think, um, from the profane capital by way of Sullivan and Irithyll. So just interesting little connection we can draw. We also, of course, start seeing these statues of Lothric knights holding their own heads. Again, it ties back to what we see the, earlier, this idea of human sacrifice. This one gives the notion of self-sacrifice, that you are willing to put your very life on the line for a cause. And obviously, it all ties back to this idea of the fire. Gotta link the fire. Sacrifice yourself in order to preserve the age. Hey, buddy. Yeah, we don't need to worry about this. Uh, do I want to worry about the enemies here? No, we'll talk about this area when we, once we get this shortcut unlocked. See ya, buddy. Beautiful. Why Sullivan's honored in Lothric? Because, uh, because Sullivan and the 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 last king Osiros were, or Osiros, Osiros, Asa, Osvo. I don't know how that English is supposed to be pronounced. The let's just say Osiros. So, uh, last king Osiros and Sullivan have had had a very good thing going for the longest time, and the connections between Lothric and Irithyll go even before them. But once those two both get into power, you start seeing um, they, they kind of start having a lot of sort of collaborative efforts between them on various fronts. So like uh, Sullivan helps uh, Osiris on some things, Osiris helps out Sullivan in other things, and it just kind of goes back and forth. The lothric um, Irithyll alliance is probably at its strongest and ironically most fair um, once Gwendolyn is out of the picture. <laughs> Os Oseros, I think. Yeah, um, the Japanese is pronounced like Osros, um, and I think it's supposed to be a, if I remember correctly, it's a reference to an actual name of, like, some Parthian kings, which were very minor, so we're not even sh I'm not even sure if, um, Miyazaki was even thinking very, like, um, specifically when he was choosing that name. It might just be something, like, random because it's, like, it's sort of Middle Eastern and therefore, uh, kind of connects into the ruins. Oh, whoopsie. That would have been an embarrassing death. But it gives you an idea. Um, generally speaking, we're going to see more stuff showing collaborations, though, between uh, Lothric and Irithyll, both before and after Sullivan. 
Oh, come on! I did not roll that uh, fast enough, apparently. Let's see. Oh. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Let's see if I can get a uh, plunging. Can we do it again? Yes. Perfect. Alright, I'm getting back into the swing of things. The rust is coming off. Yes, yes, touch your darkness, gotcha. God, what is this, Kingdom Hearts? Darkness, darkness. Uh, also want to start raising my dexterity. And actually, you know, we don't have to worry about dexterity right now because my weapon is a strength primarily, if I recall correctly. Yeah. No, both work, so we can split it a little. God, Pyromancer really is the class, the the stat splitter in this game. Dexterity, strength, intelligence, faith. No wonder I love it. And how much do we got here? Oopsie. That was not the one I wanted to select. There we go. Mm, there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty much happy with how my uh, intelligence and faith are at the moment. And we've got Vigor up where I want it. And then the rest of this can go to... Normally I would save this upgrade, but... Yeah, because we don't want to use... I'm not ready to go into Deep Battle X. Is our buddy here yet? Yeah, there he is. There he goes. Well, he he lurking finally. Yes. Yeah, so the way of white prayer in Dark Souls One is very or Nox, but this is just the localization being the localization. Um, <laughs> And naturally, being the localization, they don't even keep it consistent for the subsequent games. But the idea is that Varyar Nox, which is supposed to mean like something like Fear of the Night um, in Latin, the Japanese is supposed to be like, by the guidance of fire, may fire guide you, may you have the guidance of fire, like stuff like this. In fact, in the Dark Souls 1 DLC, this is what you hear when you hear like Elizabeth and they, they, they make it sound old Englishy, but it's like, you know, may the flames guide thee and all that. Same thing. Um... And it's something that carries over into Dark Souls 3 with the whole Firekeeper and others being like, hey, hey, have the guidance of fire. Still don't want to talk about Aldrich? Darn. Actually, you know what? This is a good time to say hi to the one guy we didn't really talk to. So we got Saint Aldrich of the Deep. Now, I've talked about this before. Saint, in this case, refers to a holy man um, or holy person. Um, this is to contrast with what we I said earlier with um, when we're talking about women who are cult saints. Those are specifically holy women. Um, you'll see this a lot, like RPGs. You'll see like a class or something. It's called the saint class, but it's um, it's just it's like restricted to women, or the character is a woman or something like that. And you see this in some anime, and uh, it's it, sometimes you'll see it translated as saintess. Um, 
to kind of specify and include the gendered aspect. But generally, that's what happens. When you see a woman and she's called a saint, always remember that it's specifically, they're specifically sort of using a gendered term for her. And it's usually oftentimes considered something separate than if they were just a generic saint or holy man. <laughs> yes, yes, there's... There's a, there's a lot of stuff that the localization is just being the localization. <laughs> Abyssal Archive will talk about that in detail, so that'll be that'll be great for people to look forward to. Sneed actually here has got in a little sneak peek early on and all that, so I would I actually it's not even a little sneak peek. So we got our one Lord of Cinder who decided that hey he's got no legs so he can't leave even if he wanted to. Sucks to be him. But he ends up being the most loyal of the lords. Despite also seemingly being one of the oldest. A Sneed pick. Yeah, Sneed pick. Yeah. Sneed pick instead of Sneed peek. Now, this term for preserve also has this a connotation of connecting um, the in the Japanese script again. So if you guys ever hear me in my commentary, I am talking about English versus Japanese. And the idea with the idea of preserved is, of course, this idea of connecting. Again, it, it ties back into this idea of fire linking. Linking is supposed to be meaning to inherit, but there is this literal connotation of sort of connecting and tying things together to link them. Um, so this idea is that same as how we sort of make ourselves part of this lineage of lords as a lord of cinder, we link the fire and we become like sort of join the line. There's this idea that when you link the fire, you're also tying down the world, keeping it as it is. Yeah, you're not going to be useful to us. Got to go fight a tree. Oh, whoopsie. That's not how you climb stairs. And we also, oh. First hint at Ludlith as Ludlith the Exiled. So he's an exile here. And then Holy King Lothric, last hope of his line. Now, the, the Japanese here is the specifically the Holy King of Lothric. So there's this idea that Lothric doesn't even get referred to by his name. It's by the name of his country. And the idea of him being the Holy King is, again, to contrast that Lord of Cinder is obviously, you're not taking a, a sort of a worldly kind of kingship. You're taking a more spiritual kingship because you are becoming, in many ways, um, king or lord of the world. And the idea with the Lords of Cinder or these kings of Kindling is that they, um, they are deciding the fate of the world. Obviously, Dark Souls 2 goes into this ad nauseum. The idea of him being the last hope of his line, of course, tells us that he's supposed to be the um, the latest of the lineage. You'll hear Lothric use this exact same term when he's talking about the Lords of Cinder. And the point trying to get across here is that um, Lothric was supposed to be the one that comes next. Um, he was supposed to be the latest Lord of Cinder. And the fact that this is written here into his, his, uh, his planned throne here gives us the idea of how much uh, Daddy really wanted him. Uh, really put stock in him fulfilling this almost like prophetic wording. Speaking of people with daddy issues. And then, of course, we got our Abyss Watchers. I'm not even going to bother reading it. It just says the same thing. The Undead Legion, the Abyss Watchers. I've said this before. Imagine these guys, when they woke up and they came in here for their throne, they would fill, like, everything. Like, there would be no space. <laughs> It would just be Abyss Watchers for all the eye can see. <laughs> so Teen Sith here, this would be akin to maintaining the eternal flame of, I think, Hestia out for the Romans. Uh, the feeling when you study all this in college. Uh... Uh, you, you could probably make several connections to different mythologies and things like that. Obviously, you look at Gwyn and there's, um, there's, there's, like, hints of, uh... Odin and Zeus in his characterization, and you can kind of uh, definitely look at um, some of those inspirations in there. Yeah, we're not going to talk to you. What's the point? I need to actually do stuff. Yo. And, yeah, okay, let's continue onward. We've had our fun around Firelink. Yeah, we can be here because we need the... 
We need to start moving. Oh wait, no, we gotta go this way. Oh, of course. This happens when you don't use lock on. There we go. Sorry, buddy. I do not want to fight you. But you know, if you want to take it, I'll leave the option. All right, so this is an interesting thing. We talked earlier about the citizens and how they all seem to have escaped up here in order to escape what's down below. A nice little understated detail about this is, yes, we're finding more of these citizens half naked or clothed um, coming hanging off the walls. But unlike other instances where we have these little traps, this might be more significant because we see there's not just them here. There's also all these knights. And there's all these little plants. Now, I talk about this, obviously, in the third beginning more extensively, but as we see as we go forward, these plants, which I think are reused assets from Bloodborne, if I recall correctly, I think that's where you, we first see them before this game, uh, these assets are basically used to represent human bodies that have sort of uh, dendrified and turned into um, more plant life. In this case, they're turning into the giant trees that are like... Um, raising their arms up in like prayer and reverence we see um this little simple idea and so the idea is to use all these little plants to kind of indicate okay there's lots of bodies here now you gotta imagine you got big executioner guy cutting off heads all these citizens are trying to escape up the tower to get onto the walls high above and hopefully safe from any of these threats that are happening down below all of these people are like crowding cramming around trying to get onto this tiny lift that ha that fits like what two three maybe four people if you really push it so you can imagine how much this got backed up which means that they were just easy pickings for one of these executioner knights to kind of come through and go bam 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 just imagine i mean just one spin attack and boop you got like 20 deaths here at least 50 100 like you can just imagine that it was an absolute massacre here and that all these knights, all these citizens, the only survivors being these hollows who managed to hang up onto the ends for their dear life until they, well, hollowed. So it's a nice little understated part of the storytelling of the tragedy of Lothric. Now as we go forward. Yeah. Ring of Sacrifice. It's all planned by Velka! Clearly. Another ember. Again, fire. Again, so the idea being is that we have this humanity which gets burned from flame. Now, embers can be acquired from uh, stronger enemies like Lothric Knights. The idea being is that because they have more powerful souls and their souls are much closer to... They, their souls have more heat. Because um, as we know from Dark Souls 1, the, the more powerful a soul gets, the more like a flame it becomes... Um, obviously, Lord Souls, being the most powerful souls, have the most flame-like appearance. But And Boss Souls have, like, the yellow aura in, over the white, which uh, resembles um, sort of, like, a lesser powerful fire. And then you got, of course, just the regular white souls at the very core. Um, we can see then with more powerful enemies, with stronger souls uh, through, in various areas, they give us embers because their the heat of their souls is warming and charring the humanity that they have being human so oh hey buddy want to play yeah there was no way this is gonna hit Ooh, i could probably plunging attack you here yes oh come on come on i feel cheated Come on, come down. Oh, 
Oh, come on. I can't, it's not high enough for me to get the plunging attack, I don't think. Yeah, what? <laughs> oh, okay. So we get our first instance of angelic faith, uh, miracles. Oh. Ooh. I don't know how that did not hit me, but whatever. I'll take it. Angelic Faith has the wonderful honor of creating the most awkward confusion for everyone involved. And is essentially trying to create light from dark magic. But it also gives us kind of a hint that there's something more going on with these knights than meets the eye when we first see them and the wings aren't for show. See ya, Sneed. Great to have you. Well now. Hmm. Dang it. Let's lead you over here. Before your buddy comes in. Ah, oh, dang it. Dang it, Angle. Ah. There we go. There's the backstab. Uh, do I care about... No, we want to go this way. Come on. Dang it. CERN. Hmm. Ooh, that I was not expecting. Actually worked out. There we go. Just a little bit of kiting. Uh, do we want to deal with? No. Nope. All right. So again, as I was talking about before, we can see these same plants being used here for the pilgrims. Kind of weird not doing this without a uh, with a HUD, but. Hopefully it's not too awkward. But as we can see, we see these same plants being used. So this is, I think, the only time that they actually use corpse models along with the plant life. Presumably to save up on resources. And it, but it gives us the idea that, okay, when we see these, we can think that people died here and their souls are, and had kind of, at least are producing these, uh, these plants that they leave around in the, the areas where they die. Little pop in there. We also get our first introduction to a higher rank Lothric Knight. We see more Lothric Knights, of course, around this church area because, of course, it's a church and it's connected to Lothric Castle, especially considering it's literally connected to the main gateway to Lothric Castle. So not only do we now see that the military is very much under the control of a religious body, we also see that the very castle itself is sort of gate kept by that religious body. This high rank knight, on the other hand, oh boy, let's, that's, uh, we, we don't want that. Will that get rid of it? There we go, much better. Now, what happens when we get the, uh, with this Lothric knight is that 
We don't see them until we get to Prince Lothric's tower uh, again. And when we get to the tower, we're starting to see like about a bunch of them. They all wear blue. And we consistently see how Lothric knights wear blue when they try to indicate that they're of a higher rank, especially in relation to royalty, versus, say, the standard knights who all wear, as we can see here, red. Now, this guy doesn't seem like he's actually... he's. Uh, he would be the kite that you would think would be responsible for killing some of his own brethren, but we also have to keep in mind, of course, that, you know, people are going hollow and everything, and this guy himself is hollow, so, you know, stuff happens. And then the the general indication, though, is, okay, well, why is he here next to this church? So it's an interesting thing to point about, okay, so if we start seeing these blue knights related to royalty and stuff here, there has to be a reason why he was put down here. And I'll, the closest thing we see is Emma here. Hello, High Priestess. Notice again, more images of self-sacrifice. Go. Beautiful. So we get our first indication of a Vort here. Important thing to note about Vort is that uh, he's essentially being kept as the gatekeeper here, evidently, that we have to watch out for. Um, but Emma is hostile to him, which becomes very interesting for, for later events as we proceed in the castle. I kind of want to do early dancer, but no. Let's try to keep this short. Hello, my guys using white dragon shields. So as we can see, the soldiers here are not using the lion shields, they're using the dragon shields. And we learn, of course, later that Osiris is a white dragon. He's someone who is very much part of a cult dedicated to a white dragon. So this is not too surprising, but it does show that Lothric is sort of straying from its ancestral roots under the reign of the Mad King. This doesn't become too relevant as far as uh the final game is concerned it was much more of a focus with the with the soldiers that we saw with the executioner knights earlier on but the thing with the wing knights is that um we, they do have the um we're, no not for the shortcut to vort the idea with killing the dancer is just that we can be able to kind of get into lothric castle earlier sorry if i misspoke at any point oh well, won't misspeak now. The idea we have, though, with um, with Osiris and the Oseros, Osiros, I'll get it right eventually. the The idea with our with our king buddy here is that he's probably uh, he was probably basically like super super dedicated to. The, the standard Lothric religion until it failed him too many times. And so he starts looking toward um, alternate places to uh, put his obsessive faith. And it ends up becoming into Seath, which generally, surprisingly, doesn't work out too well. 
Actually, you know what? Do we have a... No, we don't have a double bone. Okay. One of the things that we also learned, though, with... Uh, from this is that the Executioner Knights, on the other hand, are super dedicated to Lothric. They are affiliated insofar as they wear the Lothric flag on their chests for their surcoats. And the idea then becomes, okay, so... These knights serve Lothric. These knights are now killing Lothric knights. So what we're dealing with is a civil war. This isn't new to, to souls, of course. Civil wars are quite common in this series. Uh, or probably any uh, from soft title going forward. But it's an interesting thing to noting that uh, all the principal characters involved in this first area are all basically Lothric soldiers trying to basically fight over sort of um, an ideological warfare. In Kakante, this ideological warfare was purely um, about sort of national uh, pride and heritage. The knights didn't just wear the Lothric flag, they wore the lion symbol. So there's this idea of, okay, you got the white dragon faction versus the lion faction, right? Um, so that was sort of the where the emphasis was on sort of, okay, Osiris is taking us away from where our roots are. Lothric's gone off the beaten track. In this one, it becomes much more of a religious ideological debate where it's about, of course, the angel faith versus those who are still loyal to the standard fire-linking uh, faith that we see present in Lothric. And of course, we also have to factor in that the uh, Pilgrims of Londor are also in here making their way from the gate to the church, trying to gain access, though they're all dead. <laughs> R.I.P. to love, but I built different. Yeah. L L Logan is a... Uh... Logan has an interesting legacy um, come Dark Souls 3, that's for sure. Beautiful. Did you ever see a more perfect face? What, of course, this is interesting to establish is that we have a portal that Vort sort of climbs himself out of, but this type of teleportation is unique in that it's using some sort of um, black fluid bringing to mind dark magic. So it's like, okay, so these ice knights are from the Boreal Valley are associated with the dark, and they also have these long hairs like beasts. Oh, crap. Oh, whoopsie. I'm dead. <laughs> I'm not too worried about dying to Vort. Not because I don't think I will- I won't die to him, but because I don't think it's the biggest deal. But I wish I put my firebombs on here just to be safe. Alright, time for the fun time. Whoop. Okay, let's get some stamina. Ah, damn it. So close! That was, that was purely me wasting Estus Flask trying to get firebombs ready, which I didn't end up using. Speaking of... Oh. Oh, okay, sure.
I would say Stakes of America Re, but I actually don't mind the runbacks in this game that much. Wait, what? Oh, okay, we're... We're not in phase two already. I was like, wait, did I trigger something? Oh, that, that somehow didn't kill me. Smile. Oh, crap. There we go. Oh, Vord has an amazing design. It's a shame that he... There is no, like, upgraded Gunder version of him. Because if there's, like, a champion Vort type of thing, that would be super cool to see. Just seeing, like, what they could do with his moveset. I really like the concept of him. I'm just ashamed that he's so, like, just, like, get to the butt and just spank. There we go. Area opens up the doors. And there we go. Wider area to see. Now, Vortz basically was tasked with being the gatekeeper. His idea seems to be to keep everyone inside from leaving at this point, kind of quarantining Lothric here as, like, sort of a sentinel. Emma obviously wants us to fulfill our job as Lord of Cinder. Could we have reasoned with Vort? I don't know. <laughs> There's, that's a question you'll ask yourself a lot in Dark Souls 3. Could this have just been solved by talking? If we didn't just come in here with our axes swinging. But, eh, we'll never know. I mean, technically, he attacked us first, so... Yeah, yeah, it is interesting to think about because, like, the the wolf doggo in uh, Painting World has sort of, like, this mixture of, like, Sif and uh, Vort's uh, sort of tackle type of thing. And it kind of makes uh, kind of makes you wonder if the they, like, repurposed any attacks from, like, some, like, cut wolf enemies. Because I think that's where the Painting World wolf was. Because like, they were going to use... I think they might have taken some stuff from Old Wolf of Faron or something like that for him. Uh, but, yeah, really cool. Uh... Some quick things before we wrap up here. We see a river flowing here, leading us over to, hey, in Orlando, to Irithal. We obviously have the bridge with Far and Keep down below. Crystal Sages area. We got ourselves Cathedral of the Deep. Ocean over here, giving us some ideas. So we talked about before about Firelink Shrine over there is mountains. We can see more of these mountains over in the horizon as well. But there is an ocean on the opposite side. And... Of course we see Undead Settlement, where we're going next time. And over way out in the distance here, we can see Archdragon Peak. So already we're kind of getting this idea that here's all the places close by, here's a little further out, and then out in the remote regions of the Lothric land, we've got Archdragon Peak. And another little town or city over here in the other side of the remote regions that we never get to visit. So yeah, pretty cool overall. We've got a few stuff to wrap up around here, so. 
Yes, Dancer's teleportation is a lot more interesting because it is done from, like, the... Like, she's coming from the sky, so it's kind of, like, almost like she's being hatched anew or something like that. Um, but, yeah, it seems to be the same idea with the teleportation. I've kind of got this, like, black fluid and stuff. And if you pay attention, when the doors get closed to the church area, you can actually see there's a black fog sort of, like, appearing behind there. Kind of, like, <laughs> she's, like, doing a little, like, uh, spoopy uh, Halloween trick in order to, like, really get you get the atmosphere going before the fight. <laughs> hey, it, I mean, sh she's a dancer. She's got to know some entertainment. Alrighty, though. I think that this pretty much covers it for now. Thanks to everyone who joined for this. It was, I think we, a little bit of technical difficulties at the beginning, but I think we're able to make it work. I'm very happy with how everything turned out. So, yeah. See you guys again next time. I don't know when we're going to be doing this again. I'm going to try at different times, though, to kind of get an idea of when more people are willing to join us and kind of uh, watch along, but... Thank you a lot for helping me along this for this playthrough. This has been uh, an interesting experience, that's for sure. Yeah, th yeah, thanks. I had a lot of fun, too. All right, then. So that's going to close it out, then. Ciao!